All right, good, good evening everybody. Um, in the spirit of um, uh, good sailing organisation, we'll get started on close, as close to time as possible, um, given, given we had some uh, constraints in, in everybody eating. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to uh, introduce our guest speaker for the night, uh, Professor Lilith Bethley. Um, Lilith, Lilith has probably been messing about in boats as as long as a lot of us has, but she's done a bloody hell of a lot more than, than most of us have. Um, uh, she, she started off doing some leisurely uh, cruising in a steel catch in the Caribbean and, uh, and headed through the Panama Canal uh, across the Pacific to French Polynesia by the Galapagos. Um, she returned to South Africa to undertake a, a PhD, as one does of course, and, and um, and then got into navigating and, and, and ocean racing. Um, and she's navigated um, a few more races than, than, than most of us like, can lay claim to. Um, she's done four Cape to Rio uh, races, which is across the southern Atlantic. Um, she's done uh, uh, five Mauritius to Durban races. She's done a Lisbon to Cape Town race, which is a pretty bloody long race, as uh, you imagine. Yeah, and, and all downhill, <laughs> all upwind. <laughs> and, then, um, and then she's done a fast net, which is uh, one of the most iconic races on the, uh, on the yachting calendar. Um, and uh, to, to, uh, to um, uh, take that a bit further, she navigated the Swedish yacht EF Education in the Whitbread Round the World race in uh, 1997. Uh, 98, um, and, uh, and of course that included uh, our beloved uh, Fremantle Sailing Club as a stopover. Um, on that race, uh, after they left New Zealand, they uh, they headed for Cape Horn, but they they lost a mast uh, deep in the uh, Southern uh, Ocean, and she's got the dubious honour of uh, having rounded Cape Horn under jury rig. In 2002, Lindeth moved to Australia. And after a few years of, get, of her getting her career established at Murdoch Uni, um, she joined uh, uh, Fremantle Sailing Club and got back into offshore sailing. Um, she navigated Os Optimus Prime for several years, and that included two Sydney Hobarts. Uh, she did uh, an offshore season with Giddy Up uh, when they won the Siska Trophy, and now she races on Checkmate. Um, there's Jeff here. Uh, uh, hey, Jeff. <laughs> um, so when, when, when she's got time from not sailing, she's actually a professor at the uh, Marine Science, uh, of Marine Science at Murdoch Uni. And tonight she's going to talk about a major oceanographic research voyage she led out of Fremantle last year as part of the second international uh, Indian Ocean expedition. So please join me in welcoming Lyneth Beckley, Professor Lyneth. <laughs> so it's a bit of a delayed response to give this talk. This isn't actually on. No, it's... Oh, it is not on. Okay. It is on, it's yeah. Gone. Can't hear? Lifting up. Someone had a noise. Sticking up my nose. It's a COVID test. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Let's go back Let's go off again. Okay, it seems to be very close to this microphone. Okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about the International Indian Ocean Expedition. Going on and off. Um, and um, we set off from Fremantle last year in, in May. But just to give you a little bit of flavor for what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a little bit of something about the unique Indian Ocean, our playground. We don't think about it, but there's some really interesting things about the Indian Ocean. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about history so Heather can listen up. Um, this is about the first International Indian Ocean Expedition. Yeah, it doesn't like me talking. Maybe I should shout like a lecturer. Hello, <laughs> sir. Oh, my nose. Okay. And then I'll talk a bit about how we developed the second International Indian Ocean Expedition. Then tell us, tell you a little bit about our voyage last year, going along 110 east. Um, so think about it. We at 115 east. So. 300 nautical miles out from the WA coast. 
And then I'll tell you a little bit about life aboard the investigator, what everyone wants to know, you know, what was the wine like, all these sort of things. And then I'll give you some of the first results, in fact, you're some of the first people to ever see these results. And then just briefly touch on the significance of the voyage. Now I'd just like to note that there are three people in the audience that actually came to see with me last year. Daniel Take a Bow, one of my former students, and the Jenners, the mighty Jenners over there, Trish and Trish. <laughs> Mish. <laughs> <We've started. laughs> Mish and Kurt. Okay, you'll see them appearing in the photos, and if I don't remember to say it at the end, most of the photos in this slideshow have been taken by Mish. Any bad ones, I take responsibility for because they're probably mine. Alright, so this Indian Ocean where we all go sailing is pretty unique. You don't really think about it, but it's landlocked. The northern part of the Indian Ocean is landlocked. We have no subtropical or temperate zones in the north. So that has quite a lot of significance on the oceanography because we don't actually have cooling in the north. Like in the south, there's cool water that can come in and cool the water. The north just gets quite hot. And they have this wonderful term, um, lack of ventilation of the intermediate and deep waters. But that has quite a lot of significance for the overall oceanography. But we do have a very rare thing. We actually have what's called low latitude exchange from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. So any of you who've sailed up to Bali, I'm sure you've encountered the Indonesian through flow, that strong current that goes south of Indonesia. And so that's unusual. You don't get that in the um, Pacific. You don't get that unless they made a very big Panama Canal. Um, <laughs> and you also don't um, get it in the, in the um, Atlantic. But we also have these currents, the two southward flowing currents, on the boundaries. Now that's also unique, the Indian Ocean. We're the only ocean that has two southward flowing currents. And that's actually driven by the Indonesian through flow of South America or Southern Africa. You have a northward flowing current. We also got some very interesting submarine topography. We've got a whole bunch of these um, meridional, meridional um, ridges. And some of them are quite shallow. And I think the Jenners went out to 90 east. And I think the shallowest was 10 meters or something like that. So if you go trundling across the Indian Ocean, watch out for the big bricks. <laughs> um, there's also very strong seasonal monsoonal forcing. Living down in Perth, we don't really think about that very much. But these change of seasonal change from northeast to southwest really drives what happens in the northern Indian Ocean. And people can go really go hungry if the wind doesn't arrive at the, same, at the right time. We know what it's like to go to Darwin in the middle of summer. It's pretty awful. Um, much better to stay here in Perth. And 25% of the world's population live around the Indian Ocean Rim. So it has a fair amount of significance, despite being one of the smallest oceans. And there's also lots of stresses nowadays on coastal and oceanic environments, climate change, um, sea level rise, ocean acidification, eutrophication, too many nutrients, uh, pollution, overfishing, a long litany of things. But these things all happen in the Indian Ocean, right in our playground. Now, the first International Indian Ocean Expedition was held in 1959 to 1965. And can you imagine these dapper dudes organizing a combined assault of the largest unknown area on Earth, the deep waters and seabed of the Indian Ocean? But they did. They had no internet, they had no email, um, they didn't even have big computers. But these people managed to organize this. I don't know if they went in ships across the... Atlantic to talk to each other, but they managed to organize a big expedition. And this so much so that they were branded, they had brass, brass plaques, they had wooden boxes with the logo on it, they designed a special net that everyone would use, and the Germans organized where they would go. So they made these straight lines, and you were going to, all the ships were going to go up and down these lines. And they published that in 1959 and said everyone must do that. Well, what the <laughs> voyage tracks really looked like. Kind of a bunch of yachties going on a cruise somewhere. But actually hidden in there are those original tracks. But what happened was people got so excited about this that they actually put in a huge amount of effort. There were 13 countries sent ships. In total, 17 ships were sent to the Indian Ocean. The Americans sent the Atlantis II. The Germans sent the Meteor. The UK sent the Discovery, really well-known names that they still use. And, you know, people were working off Somalia and in the Arabian Sea, places where you probably wouldn't go now. And the Australians went a little bit around Australia, and then they decided that 110 East was going to be theirs. 
and they were going to go up and down this line every six weeks. Imagine getting shipping a ship funded to go every six weeks nowadays. Anyway, that's where they went and they decided in 62, 63 to go every six weeks so they could look at seasonality in the Indian Ocean. And they went up and down this line, they used the good ship Diamantina, and I don't know if anyone's seen the Diamantina in Brisbane, it's actually in the Maritime Museum there. So next time you go, give it a pat and say it did a good job. They used the gas coin just once, but they produced huge amounts of information, published them all in these massive atlases, and if you go to the fisheries department up in Hillary's, they have a very nice library and they have these massive atlases, they need a whole table just to open them. So we got good information about the oceanography. This gentleman here with the blue shirt is Dr. David Tranter, very long retired now, but he was a youthful specimen when he organized lots of the Indian Ocean expedition. And he's an expert on zooplankton. And I went to visit him up in the hills um, off of Wollongong. You go inland, there's very windy roads and you go up there and he has got a lovely protea farm there, which is really nice. And he told me about some of the things that they did. He and his wife went off to Cochin in India. They set up shop as the Indian Ocean Biological Center and actually trained the Indians and various other people how to identify zooplankton. So transferred a huge amount of skills. I do like this picture over, oops, over here. It does indicate an awful amount of PPE, including pipes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember which one. I think the one with the hat was Dr. David Tranter. And they published this work extensively in various journals and scientific papers and stuff. But probably the most valuable thing is that the data have all been digitized and they're stored in the CSRO Australian Regional Seas um, database. So we can actually get that original data from nearly 60 years ago. So a long time happened, 50, 50 years happened, and then a bunch of us started thinking about, wow, it's the 50th anniversary of the International Indian Ocean Expedition coming up. So, sort of different parts of the world, I was agitating from this side, other people were agitating from the US, and eventually we had this, um, sort of, between all these organizations up at the top here, I won't go through all of them, but all international agencies and organizations, we decided, yes, we would go ahead with one, we had it approved by the United Nations, and it took us three years to develop a program and a science plan, Many, many meetings. The Indians are wonderful. They always have these banners that go with everything. And the same short ones always stand in the front row. Um, so we worked on that, put out the science plan. I'm not going to go into all the detail about the themes and that. If you want to pick up the brochure, there's some brochures at the back over there and some stickers. If you still want some, maybe your grandchildren want them. And in December 2015, we had official launch of this expedition. and. We've got 39 endorsed projects so far. Australia's had a few, but this 110 East one was the major contribution. We do have another one coming up next year, also in the Indian Ocean, looking at the seamounts around Christmas Island and um, Cocos Island. And if you think you've heard of acronyms before, nothing beats oceanography. So this whole rabble of groups, you may actually recognize uh, IMOS. That's one from Australia, but the others are all international organizations. And basically the goal of this whole expedition was to advance our understanding of the complex dynamics of the Indian Ocean, um, to determine the effects on climate, extreme events, biogeochemical cycles, ecosystems, and humans. So, very long story. Um, but the 60s, the world has changed since the 1960s. The Beatles were top of the pops. Oh, taxi. Um, the Beatles were top of the pops, and I was just a little whippersnapper in junior school. <laughs> we also had um, sextants, and they've moved to satellite navigation. Now I'm so old, I've navigated across oceans with a sextant in my extreme youth. Um, lead lines and slide rules have now moved to electronics, computers, and mathematical modeling. We don't go to sea unless we've got electronic technicians and endless computers. And would you believe that the Lewin current wasn't actually known to science officially until 1980, when George Creswell, Terry Golding discovered it or described it because they had access to satellite imagery for the first time. And we just looked at, glibly at pictures like this, and we thought, oh yeah, it's like that Lewin current coming down the coast. But in fact, we didn't know that. In the 1960s, when they did the expedition, 
they claimed that this area down here was over here, just off Perth, was far too variable to set up anything. They had no idea that it was actually this current streaming down the coast. And I think last night they promised I'd talk about the Lewin current. If you're going to Exmouth next year, keep in shore. <laughs> um, another thing that we often don't think about is the independence of Indian Ocean Rim countries from their colonial masters. The whole of the Indian Ocean actually were colonies, whether it was Italy or Portugal or UK, you name it, France, all those countries. This is actually a picture on Inyaka Island um, in what used to be called Delago Bay, then become Lorenzo Marx, and now it's Maputo. And then finally, one other thing that most of us probably won't know about is that United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea um, hadn't been thought up yet and exclusive economic zones hadn't been thought up. So this makes quite a difference. If you look at all this green around all these countries, and Australia has lots of these green, that's our exclusive economic zone, where all our oil and gas takes place, our fishing, etc. And you just think back to that spider web of cruise tracks, voyage tracks. They're very hard to organize now because we're gonna go into all these countries' waters and you have to get permission. And that takes forever. Okay, so move forward a bit more. Um, as soon as I heard we were getting a new ship um, in Australia, the investigator, um, I put up a proposal to try and get it for a big voyage. So we decided we had to build on the original data, which is very generally descriptive about what's there, and actually move now into what we call processes. They could be physical processes, currents, etc. Could be biogeochemical, the sort of chemistry associated with microbes and how they get nitrogen out of the air and turn it into nitrate, and ecological processes, particularly things like food webs. So I mustered together a team of rogues, and these people, I'll just give you an indication of how international this voyage was. Um, Antoine, the second one, David Antoine, um, he's basically French, he's at the University of, of Curtin University now, and he's a bio optics expert. Helen, Helen Phillips is University of Tasmania physical oceanographer. Peter Thompson, also from CSRO in Tasmania, and he works on, night, on nutrients and also phytoplankton. Mike Landry is a sort of doyen of biological oceanography from Scripps Institute in the USA, in University of California. Um, Pilar Oliva is my good colleague from Spain, and she's currently at sea at the moment after doing a thousand COVID tests. And um, she works on mesopelagic fishes, which I'll show you a bit more about. Um, Andrew Jeffs is from the University of Auckland, and he works on rock lobster larvae called Phylosoma. Randy Hood is a mathematical modeler from the University of Maryland. Uh, Justin Seymour and Martin Ostrowski of the University of Technology, Sydney, and they work on microbes and molecular biology, something I know nothing about. And Anya Waite used to be at UWA, but in the interim, until we got the ship, she'd already moved via Germany to um, Canada. So we had some objectives in order to get our money, our research money. So the first thing was to quantify the multi-decadal change. We are going back to the same places roughly 60 years later and have a look at this change. And then do some of this microbes work and also look at um, biogeochemistry. Um, you'll see some of the figures that I'll show you. There's hardly any nitrogen in our Indian Ocean and it's grabbed by these algae from the, from the air. Just like beans and peas have those nodules, we've got similar things happening in the ocean. And then we wanted to put quite a lot of effort into looking at food webs. And then quite a new addition was looking at ground truthing, what's called bio-optical quantities for satellite ocean remote sensing. Okay, radiometry called bio-optics. And all these things on the bottom here were added on afterwards, but I'll show a few of them at the end because they're really interesting. Okay, so here's the good ship investigator, our pride and joy, it's 94 meters long, we all own it, we paid $120 million for the ship, but the same time they ordered this ship, they ordered 20 fighter jets at $120 million each. So that puts science into perspective. Okay, so this ship everyone wants to know, where do you sleep, what do you do, so down here are engines that I know nothing about, and then these portholes here are for crew and scientists. This over here is the main deck, which has a very important galley, essential, the mess where you can eat, there's a laundry, there's various lounges, etc. And then you start going up. This is more scientists here. This is the captain and the officer's quarters. This floor here is 
was added on extra because they suddenly realized they needed lots of space for computers. So this entire floor devoted to computers. Up here is the bridge deck, beautiful bridge, and both ends you can look out, it over, hangs over the vessel, so you can actually see what's happening on the aft deck, so they can see what the scientists are getting up to. And then right up top here is the observation deck. Now this is where the Jenners lived. It was called the Sound Lounge. And they had to scamper up to the seventh floor every day, so they got very fit. Um, and on top here we've got fantastic satellite communications. And on top here is something that's very rare. If you go to the Weather Bureau um, website and you look at the radar, now I'm sure lots of you do that, and you see what's coming your way, or whether you can play tennis or go sailing or whatever, this ship has actually got a ship-borne weather radar. It's the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. So they also need all those computers for that as well. But it's pretty rare to have that. Uh, lots of cranes and winches and all sorts of things like that. Um, so our voyage last year set off in May, 13th of May, and we returned on the 14th of June, so eff effectively 33 days, I think, in the end. We put on board 29 scientists, and the MNF, the Marine National Facility, who runs the ship, they put on 11 amazing technical staff. Absolutely incredible. We couldn't have done our work without them. And then 20 ship's crew. I don't know what ASP stands for, maybe Australian ships, Providores, I don't know. Anyway, they provide the captain, all the, the people, um, all the officers, all the uh, ship's crew, all the engineers, and two chefs, very important. Um, so our crew of 29 scientists, believe it or not, came from 20 different institutions, representing nine countries and 11 postgrad students among those. So it wasn't just the old people having fun, we took along a new generation to learn. Um, they're also they're very tall, like um, Daniel, he's very helpful for reaching things that short people can't reach. Um, so what we did was go out of Fremantle down to 39.5 south, and we went cruising along up the 110 east line, but we only went as far as 11.5 south, because in the old, time, old days they'd gone into Nonikwata, what is now Indonesian EZ, and it takes about two years to negotiate, and I really didn't have enough energy for that. So we decided to cut it a little bit short. Um, the May cruise in 1962-63, or 63, had actually only started here, but we went right to the south so we could get the full line. So each station was about 90 mile, nautical miles apart, and the ship does about 11 knots, so we could kind of get between stations in eight and a bit hours. So at each station we spent roughly 16 hours at them and I'll explain all the things that we did. And then we did a really cool thing on the way back. We used a thing called a triaxis. And we went to explore what's known as the Eastern Gyral Current, which feeds into the Lewin Current. That's fairly new science, so we wanted to get some data on that. So the East Gyral Current comes in here and feeds into the Lewin Current. It actually is an offspring from the Indonesian through flow and it comes back here. And we really didn't have much information on that, so we wanted to have a look. And we also wanted to look in something, because we'd saved a bit of time, I'd be cracking the whip a bit, um, Cyclone Veronica, I think it was February last year, on the northwest shelf, it had generated a big eddy in the ocean, a cold core eddy, so we decided we'd actually steam through that. So it's an air-sea interaction, the cyclone had turned up a cyclone in the sea, and it was still trundling out to the west, like many, most of our eddies do. So we went to go and investigate that on the way back, because we just had to go through it. So 33 days at sea, 24-7, and we stood watches of 12 hours each. So that's good practice for sailing. Or if you've been sailing a lot, it kind of helps. Uh, so 4,000 nautical miles, um, and we did completed all our stations and a whole bunch of other interesting things. Well, I thought so anyway. So here we are leaving Fremantle. And we all were trundled aboard in a big stripe after we'd had our passports done and everything. Um, we had the vice chancellor of the university came aboard and she hoisted our official flag, which I'd been given earlier, the previous, in March last year. So here it is. It's a little bit tatty on the ends, but after about five days, I took it down because I thought it wouldn't exist by the time we got back. And then I just hoisted it as we came back down the coast. So we had the um, Vamos out there with the Cohen family waving banners and jumping up and down, and there they sit. And we also had West Australian Science Institution, um, Marine Science Institution with Jenny sitting over there, and various others, 
with special banners for us. And then there were lots of people on the quayside, so it was quite fun. We thought there were more, but they were, we discovered they were going on the Rock Desk Ferry. <laughs> but anyway, there were lots of them, dozens at least. And they gave me nice pictures like this. Thanks, Klaus, for this picture. Anyway, off we went. So just to show you what the bridge looks like, it's very expansive. Um, all the modern gizmos and just a few close-ups there. I even let the Vice Chancellor sit in the captain's chair in case she wanted to change jobs. Um, and the ship is actually driven by this little joystick over here, but all the fantastic navigation gear and stuff, the ship has dynamic um, positioning, so it is really is just an amazing ship. And people always ask, where did you sleep and what did you eat? Um, so here's um, Kurt giving a demonstration of a very busy scientist. The cabins were twin cabins, and the whole principle was that each person has the cabin for 12 hours a day, and then the other person you know, goes on watch, and the other one that has been sleeping, you know, or well, the other one who's been on watch, you know, has the cabin. It's an ensuite over here, and cupboards and life jackets and hats and all sorts of things. Um, Eating-wise, well, even Dan couldn't eat all the food. Um, two huge meals like this for lunch and dinner. Thank God I was asleep when it was breakfast, otherwise it was full-cooked breakfast as well. Complete with kidneys. Um, the mess can take about 30 people at a time, um, so we sort of have in shifts, and then there's a quiet lounge, and then there's a kind of noisy lounge, especially when the students are in there, and after it hadn't taken a day or two, and the next moment they were in, full into the games, practicing for COVID, playing cards and Monopoly and heaven knows what, and eating lots of popcorn. Uh, so we did a bit of a test station off um, Cape Lewin, and then headed south. The weather had been great up to then, but we had a bit of a front, so that was fine. So we went through that, going down south. And just to give you a feel for the sort of teams we had on board, and this is where I got the physics to fish with the whales on the side topic. We had the oceanography, physical oceanography team, we had the chemistry team, the microbes team, the phytoplankton and optics team, and then all the old farts over here, proliferation of professors in the zooplankton and fish. But we did take some students with us. And then the sound and whales team, and that's the whales on the side. The genders do endless amounts of whale work, but they also do a lot of soundscapes in the Indian Ocean, so they brought aboard endless gadgetry that they put up in the sound lounge, and Kurt spent a lot of time um, looking at little marks on the screen, which still I can't understand what they are, but he can tell me. Okay, and then Mish was the science communicator and the main photographer on board going for time, I'll speak up a bit. Um, I won't go through all the details of a day in a life at sea, but essentially we had two watches, the 2 a.m. to 2 p.m. watch, so that's the day watch, and then the nighttime watch from 2 p.m. in the afternoon through to 2 a.m. in the morning. Now the focal thing of this, each of them had quite a lot of steaming, we each had about four or five hours of steaming, but the morning watch, this was the most important um, CTD sampling. Now I'll explain that in great detail in a moment, but the CTD is the central collecting machine on the vessel and everyone wants water from that and they want to measure all the parameters. And then they spend the next few hours working on all that water that's come, either filtering it or um, it goes to the chemists or lab experiments or genomics or whatever. Around the middle of the day we had the um, optics team here they wanted the sunlight in the middle of the, the sun in the middle of the sky, so we gave them that middle of the day roll. And then the afternoon, the kind of zooplankton people came on stream, and we did a whole lot of daylight zooplankton, and you'll see in a moment why we did that. And then we'd have a shallow CDD in the evening, just down to 500 meters. Um, the deep CDD was generally deeper than 5,000 meters. It's pretty deep out there and it takes, goes down at a meter a second, so it takes a long time. And then we do lab experiments, do more netting in the dark, and then um, head off again, heading towards the next station. So if we look, now how many of you use ocean currents? Know about IMOS and ocean currents? Only one hand, two hands, oh yeah. Yeah, Kingsley, you can put up two hands. Uh, um, so this is one that I always um, recommend to sailors to have learn to love because it's incredible, valuable data. It's free, well it's not free, we pay for it, and it's incredible data. So I'll just superimpose our transect line on there, 110 East. 
So if we just look at the sea temperature, this if we hadn't gone to sea, we would have known this already. So we can see the temperature is cold down here, 12 degrees, and 28, 29 up there. So that's quite a remarkable range of temperatures over 30 degrees of latitude. Down the bottom here, we've got what's called the subantarctic um, water in the south. There's a subantarctic front here. And then up in the north, we've got the Indonesian through flow that I mentioned before. And that current's streaming that way. Here's the Lewin current that I mentioned. And it comes down the coast. It usually makes all these funny meanders and then flows down the coast. And then around the corner, actually as far as Tasmania, 5,500 kilometers of Lewin current. But the feature that some of you may be aware of are these eddies that are formed. And just note this eddy offshore here of Perth. So straight opposite Fremantle, there was an eddy. And I'll come back to that later on. And that's the eddy that was created by Cyclone um, Veronica. So we can see all of this on the surface, but what actually lies below? And to find out, scientists use this thing called a CTD. It stands for Conductivity, Temperature, and Depth. So it has a whole lot of sensors on it that can sense these things, plus all sorts of other things. Depends how much money you've got how many sensors you can put on it. And underneath here, this yellow one and this yellow one up here are acoustic Doppler current profilers, so we can get the exact current profile right through 5,000 meters of water. And over here was a thing called a, a UVP, but the French always called it a UVP. So we got very used to the UVP. And lots of weights. And these bottles are called distant bottles, and they're the ones that get the samples from all the depths for us. Now these bottles, I brought a little one over here to show you. So those ones there are big ones, they're 12 um, litre ones. This is a little 5 litre one. And the trick is you send them down with the lids open, the bottom and the top. Because if you don't, they will implode. If it's closed like this, this thing will crumble. And I'll just give you an example of what could happen. In fact, I'll pass this round. Just don't squash your fingers in. Not liable for the squash fingers. On both ends, you can see that. There's... So, if you um, put a little bag on the top of the CTD before it goes down to 5,000 meters, so we used to always, we always buy, it's quite hard to find styrofoam cups, but I managed to find some in the Woolies in South Fremantle, naughty people. And I <laughs> took a bag of these because I knew the students wouldn't know about this trick, so they could all make their own push it down to 5,000 meters, this thing gets crushed to a thimble. I mean, it's incredible. Just think how we'd get squashed. If you close that thing and you pushed it down, it would actually break. So I'll pass these round. You can have a look. And you can actually inscribe them with different messages. So you can look at the message on that one. I think it says, no, thank you, more safe. OK, so here are these bottles. That, this is actually coming out of the water, so they actually closed. But this is all controlled electronically. And we have, this is called the rosette. And there's a little cable going across to the central thing, and this is all controlled electronically. So you let the CTD down, it takes a long time to go down. And then when it gets to the bottom, or as close as you dare, you then trigger a bottle, and then you start bringing it up, and you trigger the, trigger the bottles at whatever depths you need. Now I can assure you that getting the water budget done is worse than trying to make a COVID budget. It is unbelievable. Everyone wants like gallons and gallons, but there's actually only liters. So we have to be quite careful how we allocate water. So you do that. So here we have the um, ops room, operations room, and here's Helen, one of her students, driving the CTD. So you can see the winches. They're fantastic winches. They've got eight, eight or 9,000 meters of electronic cable on them. They're just unbelievably spooled. And they're bringing people from Norway to actually do the spooling of the, of the winches because it's a very precise science. And they bring it up, bring it back to the surface. The side of the ship actually opens up, and the whole CTD, which probably weighs one and a half to two tons by that stage, is brought on board. All the scientists have to wait outside because it's dangerous. We could fall in the sea, we could have our toes squashed. So the ship's crew actually attach the CTD firmly, and they have even sailing stuff there, little tracks, like mainsail tracks to pull things along. It's quite fancy. And um, all the scientists have to wait outside in the passage, they all got their bottles because they all want to get their water, because they want to do their science before they have time for them to go to sleep. And so here's Helen getting the nutrient bottles empty. Okay, so this is the sort of thing you see, these vertical profiles through the water column. 
So we're just seeing always in the satellite imagery the surface. So these are the first five stations. So the purple is down near 40 south and the red is near Cape Lewin. And you can see that the temperature is much warmer already. But what you start to see is how the temperature declines with depth. If we exaggerate it a bit, and this is down or shrink it a bit from 500 meters to 5,000 or 6,000, 5,500 meters, you can see once it gets below 1,000 meters, basically the sea is all the same temperature, or so we think because we are expecting some change in the bottom temperatures um, because of some melting of ice. So we have other salinity, oxygen, etc. So this is all boring like this. Um, we actually produce it into nice little graphics like this. So this is just the top 300 meters. So this is down in the south, cold water the whole way through. And as we go north, we start to get warm water. And then as we go near Indonesia, it's very warm. <laughs> But notice, by the time you get to 300 meters, it's actually fairly similar. Um, the salinity is really important in Western Australia because we have the subtropical conditions and very hot. So it actually causes evaporation. So seawater is normally 35 parts per thousand. And what we find out of Perth, if you go off 32 on the surface there, we're starting to get 36 and 36.2. So the water is more salty. So as soon as you put temperature and salinity together, you're starting to get density differences, and those are the sort of things that generate currents. And then in terms of salinity, so we have the central part of the Indian Ocean that's very salty, but in the deep south it's um, less salty, and up in the tropics it's less salty because, as you know, there's lots of rain, etc. So that's a kind of synoptic view of the surface waters. Um, we're playing now with looking at change and differences, and this is actually proving harder than we thought because the original expedition didn't have electronics. They only collected water at certain depths, and we've got data for every you know, meter of the ocean. So we've got more data than we know what to do with, but we have to reduce it so we can compare against the others. So I'm not, don't worry about all this information, but just um, first, this is actually just came in this week. Um, that's the 2019 voyage. This is the 1963 voyage. It seems to be a bit warmer up there. We did some difference calculations, and just in the top 500 meters here off Perth, we seem to have much warmer water than they had then, and up here in the tropics, and a patch here in the middle, but we do have these little plugs of cold water, which are actually eddies, upwelling eddies. So now we have to deplete the data set of eddies, because they are only sporadic things, so we have to do quite a lot more work on these um, data, and they're working on them in Tassie as we speak. Okay, so that's a bit about the physics, um, the chemistry. Um, here's Peter Thompson getting water samples out of the bottles. And this is one of the chemists that was on board. We actually went to see with two of the chemists. This guy, Peter Hughes, actually lives here in Perth, works at the CSRO. And there was a second one, Julie Jansen. And just a snippet of the data, just so you get appreciation of how different things can be. If you go to the south, um, if you, if you um, fertilize your lawns at home, you put um, phosphates and nitrates on. So we look for phosphates and nitrates in the sea because they make phytoplankton grow. So here, nitrate and nitrate's red and phosphate is yellow. In the south, there's lots of nitrate and phosphate. But as you come up towards Cape Lewin, all the way, almost all the way to, what's it, about 12 or 13 south, hardly any, very low nutrients. So we don't expect lots of things to grow because there's not lots of nutrients. But we know things grow, so what's happening? Um, silicate, I won't really worry about, but that changes as well. Um, if we look now at the biogeochemistry, microbes and genomics, and I'm not an expert on this, reputedly there's uh, 56 million functional genes in a drop of seawater. I don't know. Um, but lots of bacteria and eukaryotes, small little cell organisms. But these microbes are actually control most chemical reactions in the water column. Um, nitrate uptake particularly important in what we call an oligotrophic ocean. I showed you there's only any nutrients. So plants are growing there and animals are growing so they've got to get nitrate from somewhere and it's actually coming from these algae that are taking it out of the atmosphere. So we did a whole bunch of experiments on those and here's the responsible people. I think they put their white coats on for the show. Uh, they have these big incubators and they run all these experiments to look at what's happening with nitrate, ammonium, nitrite, etc. And then sometimes they have to go into the UV light for the experiments. 
Um, the micro people spend most of their time filtering water. Because they're dealing with very, very small organisms, they use incredibly fine filter paper or filters, 0.2 microns. And a micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. So unbelievably fine filters, it takes forever to filter, but they get the filters and then they do all this um, molecular genetics, etc. on those filters, they freeze them and take them back. And they're really busy at U UTS at the moment. They had a big close down in New South Wales, like most parts in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so we're just getting them back on track. So this was Amaranta from Italy, James um, from Sydney, and Promita must be the first ever Bhutanese oceanographer, we've decided, from the Himalayas to the depths of the Indian Ocean. What a story to tell. Um, and then we have people working on the chlorophyll, the, the pigments, the primary production, you know, algal growth, etc. And so these are some of the water samples that have been collected. And here's Peter collecting the water samples and she had to filter them through and on these little filter papers. So then you take those filter papers and you test using high performance liquid chromatography to see what pigments are there. There's more than just chlorophyll, there's other things as well. So those data have just returned, they've been run in, in um, Ville de France in, in uh, France. And then this is looking at primary production, so how fast the rate of production of chlorophyll. And um, Charlotte here had this sort of normal system, which we use, it's radioactive carbon-14. But then she somehow got to borrow this unbelievably complicated Meccano set um, from, from, the, from the US, and this is one of the first times this has been tested, first time in the Indian Ocean. We're still waiting for the results to come from there because the US universities, lots of them are still closed. Okay, so just to finish off on this um, ocean color stuff, so that's what gives the ocean its color as the particles in the ocean. And this has been recorded by satellite. And again, if you go onto the IMOS Ocean Currents website, you see a picture like this. This was during our voyage. And the green is technically the chlorophyll. Near the coast, there's lots. And the water is generally a little bit greener, so that's where you get the red. It may also be murkiness as well from rivers. But generally the Indian Ocean is a bit of a desert. And if you look at the satellite, you only see the surface film. You don't know what's happening down below. So we had a lot of testing of using optics equipment. This is um, a radiometer for measuring upward radiance and downward irradiance. And these are two lads who have a company called In Situ Optics. Uh, Wojciech and Matt, and they looked at what's called optical properties such as absorption and backscattering. So once you have this information, plus the chlorophyll data, you can start ground truthing the satellite imagery so we know what's happening on the surface is true reflection and also we can predict what's going to happen down below once we've got an idea of what's happening at the top. Um, using the UVP over here, the UVP, we get particles in the water column and these can often be small algae and generally they're hiding at about 100 meters depth. Um, there's often just enough nutrients there, so we often find this sort of layer. So they did a lot of collections of these profiles, and then we used a cytometer. We actually took in this massive container, its own container, 20-foot equivalent container, had its own um, cytometer on board. It's quite a big deal to take these really fancy pieces of equipment to see. And we were a bit worried as it got a bit wobbly going down and it sort of didn't want to work, but then it got used to the bumps and off it went and we started to get quite a lot of data from the cytometer. So some phytoplankton particles are really small. I've mentioned this is one of the smallest ones, a Prochlorococcus. It's less than one micron, so less than a thousandth of a millimeter. Minute little things, but really important in open oceans for um, keeping the whole system going. And we can measure this with a cytometer. Okay, now to something I do know something about, um, zooplankton and nekton. So we had a whole bevy of um, nets. So in fact, it was a, like an armory. We had nets for every purpose. So this was the original, it wasn't the exact original, but it's built to the original specifications of the net that they used in the 1960s. So I had one built at great expense and repeated those measurements. Um, just analyzed those. They same sort of ballpark as previous years, maybe slightly more, but it may be because the water was slightly warmer. If, uh, May, June is usually the lowest um, plankton abundance in the Indian Ocean. 
Then we had a net that operates on the surface at night, because at night lots of things migrate. You may have, if you've been sailing at night, you often see things near the surface, and that's stuff that's doing vertical migration. It comes up from the depths where it hides during the daytime, where it's dark, and then it comes up to feed in the rich um, or plankton-rich areas near the surface. And we were particularly interested in rock lobster larvae because they hide at depth, roughly about 100 meters um, depth, and then they come to the surface at night. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about phylosoma in a moment, but we were trying to catch some of those. But this is the big net that I really like. It's called the, I think in America it's the EZ net, but here it's called the EZ net, so it doesn't kind of sound as easy as it is. Um, it's a big deal. The ship's crew are the only people that can handle it. And um, I'll explain this in a moment. It's 10 different nets, one meter square, and they can open and close at depth. And you get the plankton in little cod ends like this, and then we sort them. So here's the big net. Um, there's 10 nets, as I said, and each one is open by pulling up a bar to the top. So like these, all these bars are up here. And then when you want to trip the net, so you let it down to say 500 meters, and you decide, okay, we're going to fish from 500 to 400 meters, then you trip a net and off it goes. And I'll show you a little thing there. Here's the bar dropping down, opening the next net. The light comes on when you press the button so we can see what's happening. And then we close it again and you can see all this deep water stuff in the dark. And then we fish at different depths on the way up. So we control this again from the ops room. So we have a driver of the net controlling the wire. And I'm the one pressing the button to take the samples. So then once you get them on board, then there's a lot of work to be done because you get, you know, eight to ten samples at a time, and we work through those, picking out, in this case, we're picking out all the fish and the rock lobster larvae, and then we pr uh, preserve the rest of the specimens to work at home. And so here's um, Andrew Jeffs, myself, here's Daniel, he's got young eyes, he's very good at picking out polysomas. And those of you may remember Danny Hodgson, she used to sail on Guinea, never knows where she is now, last heard of in Mexico, um, I don't know if she's still teaching diving there. Um, but this sort of pink stuff, orangey stuff, that's all the krill, and the little fish are over here. So these fish are what we call mesopelagic fish. They live between 1,000 meters and 200 meters, and at night they come to the surface. So we can catch them, and we did daytime and nighttime sampling. They didn't have anything so fancy on the first expedition. They had some nets, but they didn't know what depth they were fishing at or anything. So we were amazed to have my good friend Pilar Oliva on board. She's actually out at sea in the Bay of Biscay at the moment with a Spanish expedition. And um, she's just incredible. She can identify these things straight away. Um, I used to have to get the books and check, but she works on this all the time. So we'd have the fish, she'd identify them, and then Danny would write the names. She became very good in Spanglish and wrote on the labels. But it was incredible. It's the first voyage I've ever been on that I got off with actually every fish identified. It was just absolutely amazing, but very, very hard work. I mean, we worked like a little factory for several hours. So some of the sort of data that you get, this is up in the north, this is in the south. Oh, sorry, this is in the south, this is the north. So you get more species as you go north, which we probably guessed. And we actually get more species in the dark than we get in the daytime. But if you look at the distribution, so this is the stratified sampling, the fish larvae always stay near the surface because they know where their bread's butted and they also don't want to swim so far. But when you start to look at the adults and juveniles, in the daytime, most of them hide down in the deeper water. And then at night, there's still some in the deeper water, but then they move up into the surface layers so they can get some food. But there are some species that don't um, migrate at all. They just stay down lurking in the depths. Um, so this is what the big um, um, echo sounders look like, or some of their screens. This is a daytime one, you don't see much plankton up here, but they're lurking down here. And at night, oops, they're all zooming up towards the surface. Okay, so let's have some guesses what these things are. Maybe this one you may not get, but the next one you may get. Okay, so these are what you call lanternfish, and they've got little photophores of bioluminescence. So you can actually identify them by their little um, photophores. And here's an adult here with some photophores there. It's a different species. And here's another one over here. 
The other thing that we got lots of was what's known as light fish. So they're also these mesopelagic things with lots of different silver and dots and things. We got these hatchet fish. These are crazy deep water things, big mouths, they lurk, lurk around in the depths. So we got lots of those. Um, this is one of the ones, the cyclophone, that doesn't move at all. It just stays down in depth, so it doesn't, it's not a robust fish because it doesn't have to migrate. So it's actually quite sort of slobby thing. And it's got a tiny little eye, a big mouth, and all these scales fall off by the time they get to the surface. But they're not very robust fish. Now this one is completely crazy. This is uh, Idiocanthus. I have no idea, well I do actually know what the common name is, but I have no idea why they have eyes on stalks like this. I mean, it's completely crazy. But even more crazy that this thing grows into that. So this is a viper fish. It has a little tentacle underneath here. Reuters near the, the deep waters, open its mouth wide, and then someone, something swims to the little tentacle and it just zaps it. So some things that you may know. Now this one, Kingsley, maybe you know this one. Okay, they have a habit for appearing during the Sydney Hobart race. These are the juveniles. They appear during the Sydney Hobart sunfish. race and attack boats' rudders. Sunfish. sunfish. This is what juvenile sunfish look like. Big eyes, lots of funny spines, funny morphology. They really are peculiar fish. Okay, is anyone here from the game fish section? No, they were fishing. Okay, what do you think this is? This is a close relative down here as well. What do you think that grows up into? Okay, that's a tuna. Big eye, big eye, all the better to see you with. A big mouth, all the better to eat you with. And they're very carnivorous and they often eat their brothers and sisters. Um, something similar, the um, gemfish, but it's uh, some sort of mackerel. Um, I don't remember the common name. It's a family gemfinity. I think of the common name. This one you may see out at the um, fads, if you go out to the fads. Dolphin. Dorado, a dolphin fish, yeah. Uh, mai Mai, that's what they look like when they're juveniles. Souls, they look like this, eye on either side of the head. Then when they sit on the bottom, their eye moves around to the other side of the head. <laughs> Completely crazy, what's the use of having an eye in the mud? Um, this thing is really weird, it's a snipe eel. Its beak sort of looks like a, a magpie. But it's actually an eel, grows into an eel and lots of flying fish. Oh, this is called a snake mackerel, common name is a snake mackerel. Okay, then you get lots of other stuff, copepods, they're the most numerous things in the ocean, zillions of them, everything eats them. Um, little squid, we've got lots of baby squid, and Daniel caught some big ones, um, some strange lobster, we didn't really know what it was, lots of krill. These are these sand fleas, if you go walking on the beach here and you kick the seagrass, it's washed up, all those little sand hoppers jump out. Well, this is a deep sea sand hopper, very far away from the sand, but they have massive eyes. And then this is a thing called Lucifer. So these are some of the things you get in your plankton. And I promised that I'd talk a little bit about rock lobster larvae. Now these things are completely transparent. I'm going to pass this one round and have a look at the phylosoma. You may have to put your glasses on. It's a little bit yellow because it's um, been in ethanol for a while, so please don't drink it. Um, we, had, we were catching these things. They're completely transparent like that in the water column, practically impossible to see. But we started catching them at, on the different, um, different samplings along the line. Down in the south, we had some sort of south coast lobster larvae. Opposite Perth, in that eddy I told you about, we got the mother load, 600 of those um, in that, that site. So we've done quite a lot of work on rock lobsters, larvae, and eddies, and we know that they, ag they aggregate in eddies. They quite like the cold core eddies because there's more food in them. So Andrew Jeffs was looking, doing laser tests of transparent plankton. This is actually a type of squid larvae. It's, you know, it's a completely crazy thing, completely transparent. It's just the light reflecting off it. Um, eels, completely transparent except for the heads. Now this is the cruising section, I kept this in. This is a special new net designed for cruising sailors. We just submitted a manuscript on this the other day. Um, this is a new design, we used to call it the toilet net. Toilet seat net, which looks a bit like that. But in fact, it's highly streamlined and it's designed for being towed at five knots, okay? Usually you have to slow down and then tow these big nets and it's not very cool for towing, towing behind a yacht. But this has been designed, it's been tested uh, quite a bit in the Pacific Ocean around New Zealand. And we did the first test in the Indian Ocean, towing it at five knots. And cruising sailors can use this net, they'll provide it to you, tow it behind your boat at certain places, and then you 
preserve the plankton in the end and then it goes back to New Zealand and they do all this uh, metagenomics on it. So they don't even look what it is, they just go to the library and say, yep, it's got some of this, some of that. I suppose you can call it eDNA. People use that term more often. And it's actually called Plankton Planet. So you can go and board on your website and have a look at that. Okay, so we're coming on a bit more. How's my time going? I'm wafting on a bit. Um, food web studies. So this is one of our focal areas. Um, most of us know about large things eating smaller things. But in the ocean, there's this other whole uh, food web called the microbial loop. People didn't know about this in the 1960s, but there's all these small things are eating each other. And then finally, one of what we thought were small things um, eats these things. So we did a whole lot of onboard experiments, and I'll show those in a moment with Mike Landry's experiments. And the work that I'm doing is looking at carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 isotopes. Um, because this is some early work we did offshore here, um, as the fish or as animals get higher up the food web, they exhibit a higher nitrogen signal. Uh, the very small plankton have a low nitrogen signal, and then you also have a change in the carbon. But we're starting to see evidence of the microbial loop actually um, spreading out beyond these animals, and then some of the big kind of selps. I don't know if you've seen selps in the ocean. They're like big vacuum cleaners slurping up the small things. Um, we're starting to find those, so we're quite interested in that. So here's Mike. And you can tell he's a man of great experience. He brought his own little milkmaid stools with him. Instead of standing there trying to do things like the young ones, he brought his little stools and he could sit quite comfortably collecting his water samples for his experiments. And so this was to look at microzooplankton eating phytoplankton. He built these incubators himself, brought them on board, and ran all his experiments. So he's um, still working on these data at the moment. They've been a bit um, closed down in, in, San, in San Diego for a while. Um, other work that he did, and he's just published the first paper on this, is looking more at um, catch plankton in here, and then he'd split them into different size categories like this, and then you take those and you sonicate them, which is basically breaking them up with sound, and the copepods release any chlorophyll they've been eating, so then you can put it in a fluorometer and work out how much they've been eating and then you can start to build a food web and a budget. And some of the work that I'm doing on these, um, these are lanternfish larvae, believe it or not, called margarita. I don't know if there's any margarets in the audience. <laughs> um, it always looks like someone's drawn on them with a texture, but not at all. But here you don't get things so simple that you can actually count. One or two copepods, two copepods, one copepod. But actually we have to then run these through um, spectrophotometer and work on them at the WA, what's it called, Biogeochemistry Lab, which is based at UWA. So they had my samples just before COVID and I just got them back um, last week. And here's Daniel picking some out. So we're working on this and we've also got someone looking at the genetics of the duck contents. So we know very little about um, feeding of these animals, which are the most abundant animals in the ocean, other than copepods, but the most abundant fishes, these mesopelagic fishes. One day we'll be eating them, but at the moment um, there's been one or two attempts to catch them, but they haven't been particularly tasty. Um, and now the whales on the side, the Jenners. So here's Kurt throwing a sonar boy over the side. Um, here's Kurt with his headphones on, listening to all his famous music. No, he's actually listening to whale singing. And he even gets up really early in the morning. Or maybe this just took this picture to because I was sleeping at that stage, so then he could tell me what he was doing. So they're studying the soundscape of the Southeast Indian Ocean. Can I say for Defence Force? Yeah, I've said it. <laughs> um, so they use all these acoustic methods, and the soda boys can look for the whales because the whales make um, certain singing. And this is the fin whale, I've learned. Thank you for reminding me. So they were particularly interested in pygmy blue whale migrations. And this is some of Kurt's data here. Um, ambitious, 600 listening hours. And they got 202 detections of whales, seven different species of great whales. So you can see them all over here. And most of those were actually the pygmy blues, some dolphins, they also counted birds. And these were the sort of bearings of which the sound came from. So they were particularly used, uh, happy to see this because the blue whales migrate up towards Indonesia. And they've just had great success with tagging of them recently. So um, the red line indicates they heard pygmy blues at 
through the whole way. And they didn't suddenly see them going off this way. They were going to Indonesia. So that's the whales on the side. And then on the return trip, I said we used this machine called the Triaxis. Um, with the CDD, you have to stop the ship and lower it down. This is one designed to be towed behind the ship at eight knots, so you can cover big swathes of ocean and look at frontal systems, eddies, etc., and get the oceanography. So this was Helen's baby, and you can see it's quite a large thing. It's quite sleek and streamlined, and it's got all sorts of sensors on it, like the CDD. Um, you put it over the edge, and then you tow it. And I really like these photos because the, the CTD, sorry, the Triaxis has a camera, and so it can see, and here the guy is putting it in the water, and the machine is looking back at them, um, checking that they're okay. And then once you get this beautiful blue water, this is at quite good depth, the camera is photographing that way, and um, the reason why they put a camera on, because there's a lot of shutter on the cable, and they need to um, fix work on that. So it collects all sorts of data, so as I said, we came back across the East Daral Current. So here's the Indonesian through flow. Here's the East Daral Current flowing round. It goes in a big meander. It's not always like this. Um, this eddy from Cyclone Veronica kind of upset the apple cart here. It goes round and then came all the way around and then finally fed into the Luan Current. So we took a section through there. We did a section in the middle of this cold core current, cold core eddy from Cyclone Veronica. We went across this jet because it was squeezed between a cold core and a warm core eddy. And this is what you get. So here we are in the cold core eddy. You can see the cold water. This is the top uh, 500 meters. Cold water goes up to about 150 meters. You go in the warm core, the cold water extends only up to about 400 meters depth. So you see this warmer water. But interesting for us is you get these crazy things like increase in oxygen in the jet and reduction in nitrate. So this is a very interesting relationship that we're trying to unravel at the moment, this um, nitrate-oxygen um, link. So this has got plenty of data to keep us busy for a while, and we used it coming back. Okay, so I'll just tell you a little bit about Argo floats, uh, because this was one of our subsidiary activities. And some of you may know a bit about Argo floats if you've been to my Lewin Current talk. Um, Argo floats are about 1.6 five meters high metal tubes and they're full of gear which is just like a CTD. Again you can load them with lots of electronics and sensors but generally most of them have temperature, depth, salinity, maybe sometimes oxygen. And these things you can throw into the sea from a ship like we're doing here. You pull this harness off and this hull they call them. They're wrapped up in cardboard and then that disintegrates and then they start their job. They're designed to be neutrally buoyant at 2,000 meters. So these things sink down. They take about six hours to sink. They get to 2,000 meters depth in the ocean and they just stay there. Then they drift around in the slow, deep circulation. And then the really clever thing is they've got a little lithium battery and it turns a pump on which pumps some oil out of the tube into a little sack. And that oil going out makes it buoyant and it starts going to the top. So it comes to the top measuring everything for us, gets to the top, talks to the satellite, the satellite talks to BOM or CSRO or whatever, and then it's designed after 12 hours <coughs> to put the pump on again, pump the oil back inside, and it sinks again. There's 3,500 of these trundling around the ocean, and we've put in quite a few, the Jenners have put in quite a few, um, and generally you get a big section like this, you know, what's happening with the temperature, <coughs> put all these things together and then you can start modeling currents and start predicting currents. But there's more. There's now deep Argo and this to me is the most amazing thing. This can go to 6,000 meters in the ocean without imploding and it's designed like those fishing um, floats. It's a spherical, it's got the sheen over here. And there'd never been any put in the Indian Ocean, but I was at a conference in South Africa, spoke to some of my Japanese colleagues, and they said, oh, any chance you can take some of these? So I said, sure, you just have to get them to Fremantle. So long story, they managed to fly them. They've got lithium batteries, there was lots of drama. They managed to fly them, got them to Sydney. They wouldn't let them go anywhere in Australia in a plane. So they had to put them on a truck, bring them across another ball, and they got here two days to spare. So we managed to put two of those in, and they out reporting on the Indian Ocean now. So I was very pleased that we could help our international colleagues. And then you may have noticed the weather forecasts were very good last year. 
we put in 14 weather drifters or weather boys. Um, they consist of this dome with a satellite comms section and various probes like um, the barometer, pressure, um, temperature, they calculate drift. And this thing here is called a holy sock drogue and it, li it hangs beneath the boy like that and it's designed so it doesn't just blow away, the holy sock kind of keeps it just going with the ocean currents as best as it can and it's sending out information. So that happened last year. Um, some of you may know, if you, again, if you look at ocean currents, you'll see these little like purple worms. Next time you see the purple worms, be very happy because that means there's actually floats out there collecting good data so you can expect the weather forecast to be better. Um, and there's still more, but I'll just finish on this one. Uh, we did a lot of seabed mapping. We had a team that did seabed mapping. And so this was near the Naturalist Ridge, some funny little seamount we discovered. Um, we did um, continuous plankton recording. Oh, this crazy thing that people call the toilet brush is collecting very high frequency data on vertical mixing profiles. And it was World Oceans Day, so we had a special cake made by the chef. Okay, so that's about it. Just some significance of the voyage. Well, it's Australia's main contribution to the International Indian Ocean Expedition. We were ascertaining change. We used a lot of new technologies, so we updated the old reference points from 60 years ago. We got a pretty good understanding of oceanic processes we didn't know much about before. We, got something, we know something about microbes now that we didn't know before. And we did the ground truth thing for the satellite work. And we've got a lot of data now which is being used for physical biogeochemical modeling. And we also did you know, research in the western extremity of Australia's exclusive economic zone. One of the things, if you have an exclusive economic zone, you have rights to resources, but you also have responsibilities and you have to do science in there to, otherwise they can say, well, you must give the, to someone else. And we did the first kind of real data in the new Commonwealth Abrolhos Marine Park out here, which necessitated endless permits. Uh, we trained some postgrad research students and I got a confirmation today that we've got a, gonna have a special issue of the journal Deep Sea Research uh, we have to submit all our papers by March next year, and it'll come out just to do with 110 East. So finally, it took forever to arrange a herd of scientists in IROE2. Some of them didn't kind of play ball over here, and the captain didn't have his fluoro vest on. But otherwise, we wore our Murdoch beanies, and we managed to, and Mish took the photo. So here she is, she's in the front row, second row there pointing at some whale, I presume. And so you've got to say thanks to a lot of people. As you can realize, this doesn't happen magically. So the scientific team was incredible. 29 scientists all pulling together. Um, the support team from the MNF was fantastic. The captain and crew, they just couldn't do enough for us. Um, you have to get a big ship's time grant. So thank you, taxpayers. And um, institutional funding, project funds, uh, Mish for the photos. And then in India, the I2 office, they've got a central office there. They actually ran our stories that we wrote every day. Um, we did a lot of pre-planning and we took the photos and we submitted one every day. And also the Wamsey office in Perth also put them up on their website. So if anyone wants to go and look about more about this project, um, you can go at the website. If you pick up that pamphlet at the back, it's written there so you don't have to write it down. So there's some stickers if you want some too. And the IOE2 has actually just been extended by another five years to be part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So it's going to go on for another five years. And you always have to have the logos, millions of them. Uh, 20 of them here from all the different institutions, but it really is quite a cross-section across the planet. Euro Americans, you know, Europeans, um, lots of universities, companies, Center for Whale Research, the Government, Department of Defense, you name it, we had them all. So we wouldn't have been able to go to sea without all of these people. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to getting all the papers out. It's going to keep me busy, but not from sailing. Wow. <laughs> so that's it. Just take a couple of questions if, if somebody's got uh, a particular question they, they want to ask Lilith. Any questions? Yeah, oh, yeah uh, I heard about, uh, a lot of, uh, about uh, zooplankton and so on. What about plastic? 
do, do you have some, any research about Yeah, uh, we plastic? did do get some plastic, but actually remarkably little. In yes. the southern stations, we yes. got um, maybe the last three stations, we started to get some plastic in our yes. nets. But it wasn't as much as I expected, but yeah. there was some in the water. I mean, plastic's ubiquitous in the oceans, but I was quite surprised how little we got yeah. in the south. Uh, is it uh, do, 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 uh, uh, de depend on the uh, depth, uh, some uh, quantity of plastic, or no? Uh, did you search? Yeah, well, we had the nets that went from 500, 400, we had all those nets, and we yeah. looked in all of those, and we didn't see a huge amount. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to sit and sort through them, they're welcome to come to my lab for a few months <laughs> and, uh, and sort them under the microscope. Uh, okay. Some questions at the back there? Thank you. Yep. Uh, not on this, uh, not with this thing, but there's other trips happening. The ship is very hard to get. There's only five trips a year. Um, that's what we can afford. And um, next year there's a trip with mainly scientists from Museum Victoria, from Melbourne, and some people from CSRO and maybe some others. They're going next year. But because we lost so much ship's time with COVID, the ship was tied to the dock for six months, they've just ventured out now again only having one person per cabin and a thousand COVID tests. Um, they've just got off to sea again now, so there's quite a lot of catching up, so the program's a little bit unsettled at the moment. Okay, yes? Two. How, how did you deal, how did the scientists deal with the labs moving? Oh, the ship's incredibly stable. I mean, I did not ever imagine that we would take a big microscope like that and actually sort samples in Petri dishes with water sloshing in them under the microscope. The ship is incredibly stable. It's it's phenomenal. So it was pretty good. Yeah. But, but I mean, uh, <coughs> over the length of the, the study from the early stages, I mean, obviously the, the number of these whales has increased a huge amount. You know, so which is, whales? Is, sorry. I see Kurt's already getting ready did, to answer so the question. So did you see uh, an impact on the smaller? Uh, uh, you know, fishes and uh, the other life, an impact uh, of this big increase in the whale population? Yeah, um, we didn't set out to test that, but Kurt can maybe comment because this is his pet subject. Well, it would have been nice if we had in 1963 with the original voyage, obviously to have a, a sample of, of whale sounds. The, the technique that we we're using to count whales will probably have to rely on scientists 50 years from now to do another sample to see if the, if the oceans are, are filling full of whales again. But what we were trying to do was establish by counting acoustically the number of individual whales <laughs> that we could detect of different species. And, and so now we have a line in the sand, but uh, unfortunately, uh, 50 years ago, probably most whale populations were completely decimated by commercial whaling. So even if I had the equipment then to listen to the whales and to count them, with this military hardware that we were in fact using on this voyage, um, you know, we, we just um, we're, we're just starting out with this sort of thing now, so we're going to get to. So it's a discussion you can have a so, so, so you've got a baseline. Okay. Yeah, that's, part of, that's the way science works. It's, yeah. it's, it, nothing happens immediately. It, it'll happen in 50-year increments. So we all have to be patient somehow. Okay, maybe that's the last question, or maybe you as well. Uh, yes, uh, the six thousand or so Argos. Sorry. Those 6,000 or so 3,500 floats that are popping up and down in yeah. the Indian Ocean. No, not just the Indian Ocean, the whole world. Right. Are they going to do a bit of damage to your GPS? Nah. <laughs> no. No, they've got nothing to do with your GPS. <laughs> uh, nothing. They could bump your hole if just by chance you came by. But it would be like um, hitting one of the stick boys out here. You know, we'll do race around. It's pretty insignificant. Probably waste a lot of science money. <laughs> Look out for those things. Okay, last one over here. Um, any impressions of um, ocean warming over that period of time? Yeah, so the first data we've started looking at the differences. Um, they're big patches that are very warm. Um, so we have to just go and check that those aren't downwelling eddies because they're downwelling eddies. That's kind of not really fair to suddenly compare an area with no eddy or with a cold core eddy and a warm core eddy over two years. And then you say, oh, there's a big difference. So you have to be, we have to go and inspect all these data again and look at the deep water as well. So I think that's um, one thing we're very keen to look at is the very deep water because there's a hypothesis that Antarctic water, because of the melting of the ice caps, is actually sinking down and moving into the Indian Ocean. And that's one of the reasons why we went to the bottom in, at 38, 39.5 south because the 
we were looking for the signal, and that's not just a temperature signal, it's actually oxygen and silica, all sorts of things in the water. So it's not just temperature. So I'm really looking forward to the oceanographers getting the act together. <laughs> all right. Okay, I think that's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank, you, thank you very much, Lilith, okay. uh, just, just, just to hang here. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm sure um, uh, I can ask you all to join with me in thanking Linus for what was a really informative presentation.